to work. So there's a lot of things to attend to. So I saw things come through. I, I heard your message. Yeah, um, that's fine. That yeah. Respond. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, Sherry is online too. Sherry is my supervisor. She's here tonight too. Yeah, I can see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Got everybody. Well, I was just waiting for the rest of the commission to show up, like you said. Of course, it's yeah. like showing up for Zoom than it is for, um, you know, getting over to the senior center, so. <laughs> well, so far, I've been, this is the only time we are sort of running a little late, people showing up. Two more minutes, but we see. Yeah. Okay, not surprised there. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> Mr. Wands here, Commissioner Montgomery. We're about <clears throat> a minute out. All right, it is seven o'clock by my, I think we're still waiting for a couple more commissioners, no? I, 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 I'm hoping for more, but we do have a quorum, yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I like I didn't hear from anyone else except for Commissioner Lele, so. I didn't die. I'd like to give it just one more minute and see who comes in and then we'll begin since we have a quorum. Okay. And then as others join us, we'll just, excuse me, update the record to show, pardon me. All right. Okay, well, let's, let's begin. Um, oh, Commissioner, Commissioner Rickman's coming in. Let him connect. Okay. Um, Commissioner Lowry is joining us. All right. Just, uh, just running a little late here. Um, all right. So let's let's begin. I'll, I'll start with a uh, with the roll call. Um, uh, as always, please indicate with an affirmation when when I uh, call your name. Um, before I begin, I'll just note that Commissioner Lale um, is absent uh, tonight. So I'll just do that. So um, to begin, um, Commissioner Hickman? Present. Commissioner Jacobs? You can see Commissioner Jacobs is, is here, but I'm gonna need a... I'll go on. Commissioner Lowry? I saw his lips move his head. He said he was here, so I think you're muted. I'm not muted, I'm here. Okay, very good. Commissioner Van Meter. Present. Uh, Commissioner Montgomery. Saw Commissioner Montgomery earlier. She's still here. I don't see Commissioner Montgomery. She doesn't appear to be on my screen. So uh, Commissioner Wan. Yeah. All right. Let me try again. Commissioner Jacobs. Oh, he's connecting. Commissioner Jacobs, you're present. Present. 
I, yes, I think I both of Sorry them are having connection. Yeah, <laughs> connection uh, problems. No, no problem. No problem. I just want to make certain that since we're recording, we got everything on. Um, all right, I'll try again. Commissioner Montgomery, are you here? Uh, I think she dropped, uh, probably she's trying to reconnect. Oh, yep, uh, she is now. Yes. Uh, I've had a little more technical difficulties than I think we've had, we've been fortunate not to have. Um, I think Commissioner Montgomery was trying and then it may have failed again. So- Yes. <laughs> oh, no, wait, here we go. Commissioner Montgomery, are you here? Give a thumbs up. I'm here. Sorry, I had technical difficulties today. I, know, I, I was just remarking that I think um, it's the first time we've had <laughs> these kind of issues. I think we've been very fortunate. So, all right. So uh, with that, I will accept a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Uh, moved by Commissioner Lowry. Take a second. Seconded. Commissioner Van Meter. Commissioner Van Meter. All right. And we'll go around the horn again. Commissioner Hickman. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Lowry. Aye. Commissioner Van Meter. Aye. Commissioner Montgomery. Aye. Commissioner Wan. Aye. And I am an I as well. And I fail to note that I am also present uh, for the meeting for just for the purposes of the record. All right, moving right along to item number three. Um, this is the consent calendar. We have our May 17th, 20, uh, I suppose it should be 2021. Um, yes. <laughs> um, the, the, the agenda is correct, uh, lists the correct date. Um, it's just the um, uh, PowerPoint that's incorrect. So I will take um, a motion to approve the minutes. So moved, Commissioner Lowry. Thank you, Commissioner Lowry. Moved by Commissioner Lowry. Do I have a second? I'll second, Commissioner Jacobs. Thank you. Seconded by Commissioner Jacobs. Going well, back around the horn again. Um, Hickman. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Lowry. Aye. Commissioner Van Meter. Aye. Commissioner Montgomery. Aye. Commissioner Wan. Aye. And I am an I as well. All right. Moving on to item number four. Um, this is the opportunity for members of the public to address the commission on, on any matters not on the agenda or list in the consent calendar. Uh, for those of you who are calling in, uh, you'll want to press star nine uh, to make any public comment. Um, if you are connected to us through the Zoom platform, you just need to use the raise hand button to request to speak. Um, looking around, I do not see any uh, members of the public. Do you see any members of the public, Ike? No. Well, yes. Uh, Richard Minx is Minx is raising his hand. All right. Do you um, want to allow him to speak? Uh, yes, um, by all means, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Minx. Is that, is that, did I pronounce your name, sir? Mispronounce your name? That's correct. Can you hear me? We can. A miracle of modern technology. Indeed. So, please. I, I have no comment. I just wanted to acknowledge that I was here. Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> All right, I understand. It's a little harder, it'd be easier in person for us to do this, but yeah. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. All right, well, thank you very much for, for attending. And I, I was uh, neglectful, and as we were getting started a little bit later, to note that the record should show that our council liaison, um, council person uh, Josh Chapman is present. And we have also with us from the city, um, Ike Najuku and uh, Sherry uh, Metzger. All right, so we can move right along then I think to item number five, our public meeting item, uh, item 5A, 1140 Los Robles Historic Resources Analysis Report, Determination for Planning Application PA number 21-1, tentative parcel map 
uh, number 1-21 and certificate of appropriateness number 1-21. The Historical Resources Management Commission is being asked to hold a public meeting and take the following actions. Excuse me. Review the attached updated 1140 Los Robles Street Historical Resources Analysis, HRA, report prepared by Historic Resource Associates and determine its adequacy and whether the findings and conclusions of the report are appropriate and acceptable. Um, this is, of course, linked to another item, item uh, public hearing item 6A, which will take up a just just a moment. Um, so I think what we'd probably like to do is um, maybe get the staff um, report on this. And then I can see Mr. Sopernowitz is here. Um, he could probably address questions related to his, his analysis um, and then give the commissioners an opportunity to, to ask questions and, and deliberate. So does that seem, that seem correct, Ike? Yes, it's correct. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Typically, I give a little brief um, introduction of the project and let the consultant, uh, in this case, Dana, do the heavy lifting in terms of his work. Um, but in the time past, we have not typically presented um, areas of improvement. So for that reason, I may go a little bit beyond what we typically do. Uh, but uh, as you've introduced, you know, we're asking for the commission's review of uh, the proposed, uh, the uh, report that is provided uh, by Dana uh, on behalf of the property owners of uh, 1140 Los Robles Street. Uh, this was commissioned by staff on behalf of the property owner. And we've also uh, highlighted areas of deficiency, but what is the project? The project is really, the applicant is proposing to subdivide uh, the landmark property into three uh, parcels. Um, as indicated in the staff report, uh, the brief background shared uh, that initially when the parcel was um, bought, it was an 11 acre parcel. Uh, then there was the uh, subdivision uh, by the owner at the time to uh, be able to finance the relocation of the landmark property. Um, into four lots. So when that occurred, they moved in and the majority of the lot remained uh, the primary lot for the landmark. Over time, there have been additional subdivisions as highlighted in the staff report. But currently the request is to subdivide again, uh, the remainder parcel, which is the 1140 uh, Los Robles into three lots. Um, and the, these still will remain large lots comparatively when you look at what a single family lot in a residential one district is. Um, so it's still a larger lot. Typical residential lot is a 6,000 6, square foot lot. Uh, and these will be more, these three lots will be more than that. But the question is the setting as the historical resources addressed, which is before the commission. And on the basis of that staff, uh, indicated to the owner that options include hiring a historical resources consultant to do the work and submit to the city for the commission's peer review or having the city do it and their choice is to have the city hire. We did uh, send out a request for proposal and that request for proposal garnished uh, about four proposals and then I came at the lower end of it that is manageable and that's who we chose. With that background, we go into the site history, which is in the uh, second page of the staff report. Um, I believe there's no reason for me to recite those. Uh, it dealt with some of the uh, subdivisions that occurred to the present. Um, what we did note is when we look at the issue that we think most of you might wanna dive into uh, of land use, we wanted to be sure that the commission understand that land use is not part of the commission's purview uh, that's something that is reserved for planning commission, city council, and often staff uh, uh, management of those type of issues. But we did acknowledge that um, some of the issues that you may be thinking or weighing at the back of your mind is indeed um, issues that the city face, such as you know uh, a need for additional housing. Uh, we acknowledge that, but we want to emphasize that that isn't part of your review. You are reviewed strictly on the historical merit of the proposed project. Uh, typically, as you are aware, when we have a subdivision or when we have any alteration of a landmark such as this, 
uh, the question then before the commission is, is there any of the character defining features uh, of that property that is being adversely impacted? And on the basis of that determination, we would know or it would inform what type of environmental review is appropriate. In this instance, we hired uh, Mr. Sopolonowicz who has done this work and his findings and conclusions uh, we have in page five of the staff report and page six uh, basically says that there is no adverse impact allowing the uh, new two subdivision uh, two lots to be created out of the original lot. Um, it, it did address the issue of uh, settings uh, being uh, a significant impact, but there wasn't any further analysis if there is a need for mitigation or if is based on sequence when you call out something, which is what we are looking for as significant, uh, we would then anticipate some type of mitigation, but none was fought, uh, was put forth. Uh, and we don't know if that uh, language of significance it should be modified or is not intended to come across as it came across in the report. So that's a technical flaw that we need uh, address in the staff report, because also legally speaking, if we call out something as significant and then decide not to address it or explain how significant or insignificant that is. If someone challenges the report, uh, then the city is exposed uh, in terms of its findings and decision. So we believe that such area needs to be improved in this report that is provided if the commission concurs. But if the commission in your expertise, you believe that is appropriately stated, we are also comfortable with that. This is just stuff. You are the best experts and we are not. We are just ask, asking the question, uh, do you think this area needs to be improved? Uh, we also have a few other talking points, you know, um, uh, none of the accessory uh, structures or objects surrounding the house should be considered individually significant or contributing to historic elements of the landmark property. Um, we think, uh, if that is the case, you know, then a, a little better point could be made there. We also go to the next point, which is taking into account the most recent parcel map. Uh, most of the um, of the mature trees appear to be retained and will significantly screen the home from new construction to the proposed adjoining lots. Any gaps can be filled with planting new species appropriate to the area. Well, again, we, we think this. Uh, except from the report, um, skipped a few um, connecting dots, and we believe that the report would be better served if that is addressed a little better than it was uh, in terms of the trees. Uh, going to the next bullet point is, in conclusion, it is my recommendation that the most current alternative three lot, initially the applicant uh, proposed a four lot subdivision uh, that also would have involved a variance uh, that would not meet the lot width of the zoning. Uh, after due consideration, that proposal was withdrawn and the current proposal is uh, a three lot subdivision. So our recommendation is since there was no introduction of the four lot subdivision, the conclusion should not be making any reference to that uh, particular proposal that is no longer uh, part of the project so as to avoid potential misunderstanding. Um, we also go to the next item. Uh, it says, as previously discussed, the potential adverse effects to the uh, Warner Hamo House as a result of the proposed parcel split is the dim diminishment of the property's integrity, specifically its setting, feelings, and association. This conclusion or this statement uh, isn't provided in any other part of the report as to why if there is a diminishment of the property's integrity, specifically setting, feeling and association, whether there is some remedies that would soften that diminishment, or if, if there isn't, you know, then is there a reason to believe otherwise? And the reason to believe otherwise is not you know, fully articulated in the report. And that could make this pro uh, report vulnerable if it's challenged. And we think that needs to be beefed up a bit. Uh, then we said uh, another excerpt we sort of cited was on July 25th, 1984, uh, 1140 Los Robles Street was officially listed under 
the ordinance. So, so, so and he says, according to that, then he says, in essence, um, uh, the, the concern that staff has with this whole sentence or paragraph here is, despite the fact that it had been moved from its original location and relocated to 1140 Charles uh, Los Robles Street, the despite implies to us that there is something wrong with the decision made by the city in 1984 to designate the property as a landmark. And one, our position is the essence of the current uh, update of the HRA is not to question what was done. Secondly, there isn't any information provided to support that the council's decision in 1984 is wrong. Uh, and thirdly, our ordinance uh, it does indicate that you can relocate and any appropriate relocation is acceptable, but inappropriate reloc relocation is deemed a demolition. So the city would not have designated a parcel as a landmark if it had found that parcel not to be uh, appropriately re relocated. So we think that despite phrase should be removed from the report. Uh, we provided an example of what can be stricken and what can be uh, left so that the whole picture of the report would be um, acceptable, uh, both legally and from professional standpoint in our view. Those are the areas of improvement that staff uh, would present to the commission for consideration. Again, that's just our opinion and you have the best uh, insight into these uh, things, you know, and so we rely to your expert opinion. And that's my brief presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Excuse me, I was on mute. Um, do uh, any of the commissioners have any questions uh, for Ike before we uh, hear from Mr. Spernowitz? Don't, I don't see any. So uh, Mr. Spernowitz, do you want to uh, add anything or uh, to, to what's been presented or what you, uh, what, what Ike's presented and what you've laid out in, in your report? Hello, uh, this is Dana. Hi, Dana. Hi. Uh, so let me uh, let me back up a little bit and kind of kind of go through the analysis, at least as I as I envisioned it. So there were there were different aspects of the property that I wanted to better understand. Of course, where it was located originally. You know, the age of the house. Um, when it was moved, what occurred after it was moved, uh, the decision to landmark the property, what was that predicated on? And then, you know, what's happened to the house, to the grounds of the house since it was moved in the mid 19 I think it was 1976. And uh, let me say one thing to, uh, about the owners. They did a, a marvelous job of preserving that house. Um, there, there are a few houses that I've seen in California in, in the Davis area that are so impeccable in terms of historic, particularly the interior of the house. It, it really does read like a 19th century house. So one of, the, one of the questions, one of the important questions, perhaps the most important, is why was it landmarked in the first place? And the presumption, it, it's a little vague, I have to say. And my presumption is number one, it's one of the, it is the oldest house that's in Davis at this time, standing, a standing house, and that it does, you know, it did, it was an important house in terms of its architecture, representing, you know, the late 19th century and what I would call more of a Greek revival than I, I think Italianate, and it has a long history. But most importantly, its architectural standing, its architectural merit is, I think, the most important aspect of the house. And that, that leads to the question about the other aspects that in a normal type of analysis, say for the National Register or for a Habs hair or some sort of a finding of effect, either a CEQ or a NEPA, what you take a look at and analyze. So setting clearly, I mean, assuming the house has integrity, which I think it, it does, assuming the house is one of the oldest houses in Davis, and assuming that 
the reason it's landmark wasn't really necessarily where it was moved to, but more so it was the preservation of the house as an architectural, you know, testament to the late 19th century, one of the oldest homes in Davis, or now in Davis. Um, and setting then becomes, you know, the, the most paramount question along with association and, you know, um, feeling because the house does have, does retain workmanship, it retains its original materials um, and all the other attributes. And my bottom, well, my conclusion was that the setting, although important, was trumped by the house's, the home's architecture. In essence, its architecture was the most significant aspect of why that particular dwelling was determined to be a landmark property. And the setting um, is different, but in many ways it's, it's screened quite well by the vegetation. So when you go there, you know, does the home, you know, I asked, does the home read the way it would have read, you know, when it was originally constructed? And there were, of course, a few additions. And I thought it did um, when you're standing and looking at the house. And taking photographs and, and walking around with the uh, proposed site plan, the three lot split, I also felt that um, depending on where the houses are sited, and there, there seems to be ample room for them because the lots are bigger, that the house would still read, in essence, the way it, it was intended um, on that particular property. So I wasn't questioning that the property isn't a landmark. Um, the question was the movement of the property to its location. Certainly, you know, when it was done in the, in the uh, 70s, could have easily negated its standing. But I do think it wasn't necessarily that they stuck it on a property, you know, that was 11 acres. I think it was mainly the house. And I think if they put on a property, my, my guess is that if it was on five acres or four acres at that time, it still would have been a significant or a landmark property in Davis. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't a specific, you know, uh, size of the acreage that would, you know, kick it over in terms of being a landmark property. The other factor is that, you know, where it was standing, um, you know, and this is not necessarily tangent, but it was getting vandalized, the house. And it was near a freeway. The freeway, Highway, you know, 80 was built um, in the 60s. And that, you know, had an impact, you know, at the, at the former location of the house. And there were other, you know, intrusions that were going on at the time at that location. But I guess basically I felt after looking at all the evidence, looking at the rationale for landmarking, uh, looking at or analyzing the aspects of integrity in terms of what could have been an adverse effect, in this case, setting, feeling, association. I, my conclusion was that the three lot split, as I said, doesn't reach a level of an adverse effect. To me, it's, it's less than an adverse effect. So it's not a significant effect to this, to this particular resource. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a positive effect, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a positive uh, effect by, you know, the, by having a three-lot subdivision. So that, that's sort of my, uh, my take on it. And, again, I have to commend the owners or the owner of the house now that they did a wonderful job preserving it. And if you've ever been in it, it's a remarkable uh, late 19th century interior with a lot of the attributes, you know, the millwork and the doors, windows, and transoms and stairwell and so forth that um, oftentimes are removed or they're modified later on. And uh, the, the building in the back was an addition. I guess it was a bunkhouse, and it's pretty old, too, and that was attached, if you didn't realize that already. The, all the ancillary buildings that are on the property, in my opinion, are non-contributing. They were built mainly in the late 70s or 1980s, and they don't contribute to the historical character of the home. So uh, the removal of them is not a negative effect. It's probably a positive effect in that context. Any questions? Well, so thank you, Dana. Um, yeah, um, I, I'd like to throw it open to the commissioners for questions either of Ike or of, of Dana. Um, on on the analysis. 
So let me let me see. I can flipping through here. Oh, it looks like Commissioner Commissioner Hickman. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I had a question. I mean, I don't know if this is for Ike or for Dana. Why this was originally an 11-acre parcel was originally intent for this to be relocated as a farmhouse. I, I mean, I know the Palms Theater was near here, but I, I mean, when this is relocated in the 1970s, I don't believe anybody's really doing agriculture in this area. Do we have, do we have any idea as to why it was such a large parcel was put on? Well, the owner is here, so she might be able to assist us with that answer. I don't know. Uh, Jim, do you mind taking that question? Yes, uh, let's, let's hear, hear from Ms. Silman. Uh, you're, you're muted, Ms. Silman. Hello? Yes. Ah, Please. Um, tell me the question again, because I was trying to get through on my phone and it, my phone just says waiting, waiting, waiting. So I'm glad to be unmuted. Uh, the question was so about my the question original. Is, yeah, about, about the original lot, that this has moved to an 11 acre parcel. And I, I, my, my question goes to the, the setting of this. That, Today, it's a suburban setting. I mean, it's surrounded by, by tall trees, by a swimming pool, things like that. W was there an intent when it was moved in 1976 that it be an actual farming parcel, that there, there was going to be uh, horses or livestock on the parcel, there was going to be farmed in any way? Well, did you no, have any insight uh, as to why it was 11 acres? The 11 acres was the only parcel I could find on this side of the freeway, um, which would make it feasible to move the house onto. We had another parcel on the other side um, of 113, but it was not practical to move the house there. But the 11, the 11 acre parcel became available and, uh, but it was really a bit too large for us to handle. And so we subdivided it at the time. What, was there anything on the parcel at the time that you moved the house, do you remember? I do indeed. There was absolutely nothing. No trees, just grass. And, and so you made the decision to move it to this parcel just because it was available. Yes. You, and your intent at the point was to use this as a residential home. There wasn't any intent to make this a farm property or anything of the sort. No. Thank any you. other questions, Chris Rickman? Oh, no, you're okay. Um, uh, other questions from uh, commissioners, either of, of Dana or of Ike or of uh, Ms. Zillman. Okay. I don't. Oh, I a, oh. oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Commissioner Bamiter. Go ahead. I was. I kept flipping through, and I, I, I missed you. Go ahead, please. Um, I guess I had a question um, as to whether or not there is any sort of site record available um, for this property um, dating to the 1980s when it was um, established as a landmark. That question for me or right? Um, I guess right. <laughs> well, I, I'm not aware of one, Ms. Dana. Ike, are, are you? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not. What the, the, the situation is actually, maybe Mrs. Silma might know. I, I don't know much about it because I searched our records to provide information to Dana. And for the oddest reason, I don't even see the original files. Uh, either it's misplaced or it's boxed somewhere that I couldn't reach. So I did the best I can under the circumstances, but I didn't have time to go to Hardy Weber Museum to research that. And I don't know if Dana ever made an attempt to reach out to the museum. I did, I didn't get through to anybody. So oh, I see. I, I'm not aware of a, a record. Um, uh, other questions by uh, Commissioner Van Meter, do you have any other questions or any other uh, questions? No, no. That was it for me. Okay. Can I do a follow-up question? Absolutely, go ahead, Commissioner. So, I mean, my question would be for Dana, why not just say the setting's not contributing? That, I mean, that, that it, it seems to me when this building is designated in 1984, it's entirely based upon the building and the setting is in no way a contributing aspect of the building. It, it doesn't seem to me that the, the site that this is on currently in, in any way contributes. And it doesn't seem, I don't think it's gained significance since 1984. I, I don't see the setting as, as being 
uh, of any importance to this building. So therefore any alteration to the setting doesn't seem to me to matter. Well, let me answer that by saying that I do think the setting matters. However, I do agree with you that the setting, just as I kind of said in my introduction, the setting um, is of lesser importance than it would be if it was a farm or a ranch or whatever, because the house uh, is the resource of significance, the architecture of the building itself. But you can't, I mean, you know, I, if you had a house and you had a high rise behind it, I mean, there's no way that you can't at least take into account what effect that could have. It could be a shadow. It could be lots of things. But um, I think you're right in, in, a, in, the, in the big picture. But I do think that the setting, if it, it, basically what I look at is whether the house reads the way it would have read, read its vocabulary, meaning its architecture, its design, style, and all that, that it would have looked like, you know, in the 19th century. And because of what Jean did, you know, and her husband and so forth, with the planting of trees, that went a long ways to muting or, um, I want to say, filtering, you know, anything that's, you know, a non-contributing aspect. Now, that doesn't mean that the settings, you know, uh, extremely significant or important, but it does go to how you feel when you look at this house. When you stand in front of the house in the lawn, you look at this house and you don't see anything else around it, and you probably won't when things are built from that viewpoint, you know, it, 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 you could be looking at something, you know, in 1860 or 1870, you know, if you didn't know better, you know, that you're in front of a house. So that's my point is that it it is it is part of the analysis. It's, it's may not it may not be as important because it's been moved, and you know it's not on a 500 acre ranch anymore. But we all know that, and it was landmarked after it was moved, at a period in which that whole area of South Davis was being subdivided. In fact, it was already subdivided, you know, and in, 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 uh, as you approach um, Los Robles. So they were, you know, I'm sure that folks that landmarked were aware of that and, um, you know, decided that even though there was encroachment, suburbanization going on, that was, a, that was okay at the time. And I feel the same way today that, you know, there's going to be more encroachment, but that doesn't necessarily ne negate the importance of the house architecturally. I, I, I would just add a, I've passed by this property a number of times. Mm -hmm. I've never gone in front of it. I've never gone down Los Robles. Mm -hmm. I've always walked along the, uh, the the pathway, the bikeway that runs along Cuda Creek behind yeah, it. Yeah. And, and from that perspective, mm -hmm. you can barely see the house. And, and what you do see is the pool and there's sort of like a, there, there, there's a structure over the pool and it doesn't have any sort of integrity of setting. I mean, what you're seeing is is sort of a modern, there are some, there are some sort of out, uh, agricultural buildings, uh, agricultural outbuildings like near the property. But when you look at the property itself, if you look at the house, you're looking across that pool, which doesn't have any integrity of setting. I, and, and if you go to the old parcel, if you go to where this was originally from, mm -hmm. there are a number of agricultural outbuildings that, mm -hmm. you know, are conspicuously missing from this property. I, 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 I just don't see the setting as mattering here. I, I feel like we, we have severed any association of setting at the point that this property was moved and then subdividing the parcel further, I, I, I just don't see any big impact. And, and it seems to me that the shade trees, they don't contribute to the property because the, you don't have the, the agricultural outbuildings that I think are essential to this sort of 19th century building. So whether there are trees there, whether the trees get removed, the thing that got designated in the 1980s is the building itself and it's the architecture of the building mm -hmm. and the setting's gone. And the setting was lost a long time ago. So further alterations to, to the setting just don't seem to matter to me. Well, I, I think we're in general agreement that yeah, I, you I know, the, it, it is the building that is significant. And it's, it's not the other attributes. I mean, it's, it's, is the building intact? And it absolutely is. And it's still, you know, setting aside setting, it still looks and feels and reads the way it was. Um, mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, when it was built. And um, to me, that's the most important aspect of the analysis. 
um, in terms of potential, you know, significant effects or adverse effects from the subdivision. Um, because, again, th there's no language that I've found that is specific to why they landmark the property in any detail. And I have to think, again, that it's, it's p probably because the building, the structure is the oldest in the, in the city, and um, there isn't anything, you know, quite like it in the city that I'm aware of, but it's certainly the oldest and had, had integrity. So... And I think it's sort of unsaid that we would not do that today, that this property would not be a landmark property today, that that, that severance of setting today would, would likely cause this not to be a historic resource. That's, that's, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer, but it's certainly possible. Uh, other, other, thank you, Dick, uh, Commissioner Hickman. Um, any other questions from the commissioners? I'll flip through here. Um, I'll just note um, for the record that I live in the vicinity of, of uh, Los Robles, being living on, on, on Mono Place. So, and like Commissioner Hickman, I've, I've gone the, the bicycle path and I would just concur about the, the issues of setting. Although it seems to me that it, it, to some degree, it's, it's just a question of presentation in, in the report. I mean, ultimately it's the same conclusion. Now, with that in mind, the one thing I do want to be certain that we get on the record is we're being asked to um, uh, make a determination about the adequacy of the HRA. And I believe staff is also asking us about their proposed changes to that uh, report uh, that Ike outlined. So be before we sort of move forward, I wanna be certain that commissioners consider, have, have considered all of those. And if there's any other suggestions they would like to make as to changes to be made for in the HRA or whether or not we accept or individual commissioners accept um, the staff suggested changes, I'd like to get that on the record to have, have a hearing uh, on that. Uh, so that in mind, what's, what, what are commissioners' opinions on the recommended staff? Let's start with that, that place. What are the commissioners' um, feelings about the recommended staff changes to the report? Does anybody have any objections to the staff suggested changes? Let's uh, we'll go there. Commissioner Hickman. Um, I feel like I'm monopolizing the time here. I, I, I think the, uh, the ancillary structures comment is a good one. I mean, I think just providing a little bit more support for that makes sense. I, I, I think I had, I, I took the, the final staff comment about removing the criticism of the 1984 designation. I feel like it's essential to comment on the fact that this is a moved resource and that that by contemporary standards, by current standards, you would not be likely to designate this building as a land. That, that because you have severed its, its association of setting, it would be much harder to designate this as a landmark resource. I, I think that needs to be addressed in the report. And I, I think it, maybe you might, um, you, you might sort of nitpick with some of the, the language that's used and the way in which it sort of criticizes the 1984 decision. But I think it has to be addressed. And I think what's in the report right now is, is fine by my reading. It's, I, I think that's, that's Dana's take on the decision, the 1984 decision made. I'm more or less in agreement with it. So I think it's fine to leave that language in. And I'm not really in favor of taking it out. I, I don't think we should pretend like the, that the 1984 decision might've been wrong, that, that it wouldn't meet current standards. Thank you, Commissioner Hickman. Uh, other comments by commissioners? Just, just for me to respond, I, I think, I think that's fair. I think it's a fair inclusion. Um, uh, that is to say, I, I, I think that um, Dana's characterization is is fair, and I don't think it necessarily does violence. I mean, what was what's done is done, and I, I think the purposes of this HRA uh, are are pretty clear. Is that it's not here to revisit the issue of uh, the city landmark status, but that does inform part of the analysis that that proceeds because. What we have to be thinking about is these reports providing a kind of paper trail, a kind of record, should there be subsequent decisions that are that are made. And so 
Um, I, I too would uh, favor keeping that in. As for the as for the other staff suggestions, I think all of those would would be would be to the good as well. Um, again, just to give us sort of a fuller account, uh, a, a, a more a more um, um, thoroughly analyzed. I mean, I, the report right now touches on some of these issues, but I think there's opportunity just to connect a couple of the dots. I think is as Ike was uh, characterized it. Um, but I would agree with, the, uh, with Commissioner Hickman that I think it's fair to leave that, that in uh, just as a way of capturing the history. Um, the history in, in, in 1984 is, and the standards 1984 are different than they are today. And so I think historians have an obligation to the history of history as much as the history itself. So, um, so with that, I mean, if, if, there, if there are no other comments, do we um, on this, do any commissioners feel differently about the inclusion or the revision to this final, um, this final staff suggested revision regarding the city landmark status? Um, or is the commission inclined to agree, or is the rest of the commission inclined to agree with Commissioner Hickman that that should be kept? And as, as, as it stands now from what I'm hearing or actually not hearing, um, that we we're fine with all the other staff recommended changes. Commissioner, can we, can you rephrase the, uh, the specificity in terms of the, uh, the comment that Ike made or the revision that you guys, you folks want to uh, um, consider some oh. uh, modifications on so I understand it better? Oh, well, I, I think what, what was before us is looking at the staff report. There yeah, are no, I understand that, but I'm just saying what, Specifically, what what is it on the staff report that you would concur with that so, you felt? I, I was talking about the comment on page eight, which is your comment about, in essence, the 1984, in 1984, the city of Davis, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I, and, and Ike was proposing to make a number of changes to that, to essentially remove the criticism of the 1984 decision. I, I feel like your original language was fine. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't intending to criticize the, the decision. I think the decision was, at the time, may have been, you know, uh, uh, warranted, given, you right. know, where things were in terms of uh, historic resources. It's just that I think it's the same observation that you folks had in terms of, you know, today, to look at that, moving a structure like that, there may be a different uh, result, that, that's all. Um, yeah, and, and so uh, Dana, I think the way it stands right now, that's the only staff suggested edit that um, the any member of the commission has has voiced a disagreement with. All, all the others, I think, stand. Um, although that that is a question. I just want to be clear for for the record um, that the, there's no other comments about any of the other staff suggested edits. Well, that's fine. I just wanted to clarify that. Sure, sure. I, I mean, I guess I addressed the one on page seven, which is this concern about the potential adverse effect. I, I mean, I, I agree with with Ike here that that if you mention a potential adverse effect, it sort of then requires you to discuss what you would do to mitigate for that adverse effect. And I, I think maybe the way we deal with that is by is by more explicitly stating that the setting that the that any integrity of setting was was severed by the movement of this building. And therefore there isn't an adverse effect to the setting of the property by subdividing the parcel. That, that setting is gone. That setting is, was taken off the table once you remove, which relocate this property. That's a, further, that's a further suggestion you would make in terms right. of revising or responding to the staff suggested edit. Yes. It's just move the discussion entirely because, uh, okay. I, mean, I think Ike's right. If you say well, potential adverse effect, you got to deal with it. And, and so I think we, we, we deal with that by saying there's not an adverse effect to the setting because the setting was already set. Well, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with that because I think two things. One is, number one, is that, you know, the house could have been placed on a slope, a hill slope. It could have been placed next to a, you know, a modern, right next to a modern house. So, you know, the, the placement of it was somewhat deliberate and it was in a uh, uh, what I want to say the setting between where it was and it is in terms of the environment wasn't all that different. So 
So I, 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 I think setting was an, isn't a factor to agree. And I, the only thing I would say is that it's not as important anymore, but I don't think you can just say the setting has no, no intrinsic value to the house. Because, I, think what you're, go ahead. I mean, you used to have agricultural outbuildings and, and once, once you've severed any association with well, those outbuildings. Well, that's part of the setting. That's not the whole setting though. The setting could be the physicality of the landscape being flat, but I, that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing in general with you that I agree. There's no other, you know, outbuildings on the site, but it isn't as that they moved the site to the middle of Davis in the downtown. So there is some, there is some validity to the setting, having some sense of place, you know, in terms of where it was, it's not, it's not pure. It's not a hundred percent. But um, it, it's still, I don't know, I it's just, I mean, I have a different, little bit different opinion in terms of, you know, the setting today and the value, you know, when you stand in front of the house, if you've done so, and you were to do that where it was before, I think you'd probably understand a little bit better. <laughs> but the, you're right, the L buildings are gone. I mean, obviously there are trees. There were trees at the other property, by the way. They, they landscaped it for shade. A lot of the trees died. But um, that said, um, you know, it, it's not as paramount as the as the building itself, put it that way. And, and there was no attempt Less to use this important. property as an agricultural property. I mean, the, the setting of the original building was a ranch house, an agricultural house. That well, this is a residence. That's that's a that's a fundamental. I I, I don't want to I don't want to belabor this point. I, mean, I think we're large in agreement. Yeah, and I, I don't I, actually, Dana. I, I think what Commissioner Rickman is proposing makes the makes the task easier, because. I think the city's comments, the staff comment that if setting is going to be addressed in the way that it currently is being addressed in the report, then there's going to have to be some more detailed discussion about mitigation measures. Otherwise, it feels incomplete. So to some degree, well, the, the, yeah, I mean, the, the mitigation would only be if the setting Dana, was Dana, consequential, Dana, but it, Dana, it's fine. Dana. I'm fine with it. It's all right. Dana, just let me finish. Go ahead. Let me finish. Um, I think that it just makes it a, a little a little clearer. Now, if, if that's if that's important, I mean, we're being asked to provide our input, Commissioner has provided his input. I think it makes the task a little bit easier um, in terms of, in terms of completing the analysis for, for the fullness of, of the piece. If you feel strongly about about the setting, um, I think this commission can offer its recommendations to the city, but ultimately it'll come down to whether or not we we, we feel this report is is adequate. So I don't want to I don't want to cut off discussion, but what I do want to do is keep us going and advancing through this. So at the end of the day, the fundamental question is, is does the commission feel, uh, barring there being any other comments about the staff edits, I think maybe we'll, I wanna skip ahead a little bit and then maybe back up, which is, is there any concerns among the commissioners that the HRA currently is inadequate? I think uh, Commissioner Lowry has, uh, has his hand up. Okay, I can't, unfortunately my screen seems so small, so I couldn't, I couldn't see everybody. Commissioner Lowry, please go ahead. Um, I would just like to say that regarding the um, question of the context that um, I'm not, unless we know that the original house was in a setting with no trees and no, um, you know, no natural entourage, it's reasonable to think that um, the, the current immediate setting for the house um, is a replica of the original setting. You would expect that a farmhouse would have trees around it. And, um, and indeed it does now. In fact, they kind of isolate it from the surroundings uh, pretty effectively. So I, I think that, that the context, the immediate context has probably been preserved, um, but it's, its location on a 11 acre farm has not, but that's, that shouldn't be a deal breaker, I don't think. That's all. A any, other, any other commissioner's comments? want to weigh in on it. And she oh. there, there are people also who are on the other side. I don't know if any of them wants to speak. You know, then we can go to public um, comments when the commission is done discussing. Uh, other uh, other people want to speak? What, uh, I, I, I don't know, but so far we are in the discussion of the commission. I'm suggesting that before you make your final decision, it, it might be possible that those folks who are waiting have something to add. Uh, and I also want to clarify that uh, most of the questions that is being raised about the setting and things like that and what occurred, uh, Mrs. Silman is 
the original owner and has lived there since they moved the building. So she would have first hand knowledge of whether the setting was part of the discussion in 1984. Uh, and my understanding too is she has, and her husband uh, were the people that uh, also pushed to have the building designated as a landmark. So that she would have a, a, you know, a detailed insight as to the setting and whether what they did is part of the typical of that era of oral agreement that we need to do A, B, C, and D in order to bring the setting as Commissioner Larry has pointed out. Uh, some of that can be addressed there. One of the things I do understand that prompted the staff comment is uh, several folks prior to my time being uh, involved with the commission and uh, since I was involved with the commission, one of the issues that's always been raised is setting. Uh, that th there needs to be some setting recognition and I don't know where that came from, but she might know. Well, um, that's, that's a good suggestion, Ike. Is there, um, since I don't think there's any other commissioners comments on any of these items, is there anyone else uh, present who'd like to speak um, regarding the uh, HRA um, report? Um, and of course, if you're calling in, just a reminder, you'll want to do, uh, you'll press star nine on your phone. Um, if you're connecting to us through the, the Zoom platform, you'll want to use the raise your hand button to request to speak. Is there anybody like to speak on this? I'm not, seeing any, I'm not seeing any hands raised uh, no, from the neither attendees. Am I. Uh, neither am I. Thanks, 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 Ike, because it's, <laughs> I don't want to miss anybody out on, on this discussion. So um, I think that does take us fundamentally to, to the question that, that's really before us, which is, is this report adequate? It seems like the staff has some recommended edits um, that, but otherwise, whether these edits are adopted, Ike, because I'm, I'm reading the staff report, um, the staff recommendation is that the HRA be adopted, that even without these edits, it's adequate. Um, so my question to the, to the commissioners, is there, is there any comments or concerns about the adequacy of the determination of the report, leaving aside the, the, the suggested edits for just a moment? Yeah, I'm not seeing anyone, any commissioner indicating that they have any raising their hand or asking to speak, indicating there's any concerns about the HRA, so it's it's adequate. So then it comes down to the suggested staff edits, which we've been asked to provide input to. So, excuse me, Commissioner Hickman's expressed some desire to retain um, the original language that Dana provided in his report regarding the city's decision, excuse me, back in 1984. And Commissioner Hickman suggested that the, um, the suggested edit regarding the settings um, be recast to um, reflect the analysis that places less of an emphasis on, on setting. Um, otherwise, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just trying to summarize it for our decision making. Um, otherwise, Commissioner Rickman concurs that the report should have a fuller discussion of mitigation measures that might be required given the potential impacts to setting. Um, I will accept a motion for, uh, if someone was embody that in a motion, um, I'm willing to accept it. I'm open to it. So moved, Commissioner Van Meter. Okay. Commissioner Van Meter has, has moved that we accept, to be clear, the motion is to accept the HRA as adequate and accept all staff changes save the last one regarding the characterization of the city decision back in 1984 and the question of setting. That our recommendation is that that either that discussion setting in, include a further discussion of mitigation measures or that it be redrafted to reflect to reflect the fact that setting is, is less important than the HRA uh, currently seems to suggest. Second, Commissioner Lowry. Okay. Oh. I, no, no, I, I hear a second. Uh, it was Commissioner Lowry. At least he gets credit for it. Uh, second from Commissioner Lowry. All right. So 
So let me just get this down. Commissioner Van Meter, motion, second by Commissioner Lowry. All right, we'll go around the horn. Uh, Commissioner Hickman. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Lowry. Aye. Commissioner Van Meter. Aye. Commissioner Montgomery. Aye. Commissioner Wan. Aye. And I am an aye as well. So we've accepted the adequacy of it. Uh, we provided uh, the suggestions uh, to staff. Is that is that all we need to do on this particular item, Mike? Yes. Great, great. D okay. Dana, do you have any questions of the commission? No, no, I, I, I really don't. Um, you know, it's uh, these things are somewhat subjective as, as anybody can understand. And, you know, what somebody sees as important, you know, may not be as important to somebody else, you know, setting and so forth. But, you know, there, there, there had to be some aspect of analysis because that's why I was asked to, uh, to perform an analysis. You know, and if it's not the building itself, then, then what is it? And uh, the only, you know, factors that, you know, could be jeopardized by the subdivision could be, would be the same. You know, or the feeling or association, which is all kind of related. So, I mean, that, that's why it appears that there's more time spent on that. That's why what I was asked to do is to focus on that versus the building itself, which is not being jeopardized by the, by the plan subdivision. So. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so moving on, we come to the related item, item uh, 6A, another public hearing item, um, 1140 uh, Los Robles Street planning application 21-1. Certificate of Appropriateness 1-21 for proposed three lot parcel subdivision. So the commission is being asked to do two things and I'll just read them again for the record. We're being asked to determine that the proposed project is categorically exempt from further environmental review pursuant to CEQA guidelines section uh, 15331, which exempts projects limited to maintenance, repair, stabilization, rehabilitation, restoration, preservation, conservation, or reconstruction of historical resources in a manner consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties with guidelines for preserving, rehabilitating, restoring, and reconstructing historic buildings, 1995. Um, Weeks and Grimmer. And number two, um, approve the certificate of appropriateness one, number 1-21, one subject to the finest conditions in this report. So um, with this planning application, um, we'll first ask staff um, if they have anything to add, and then uh, we can uh, address it with the project proponent. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, what I want to add is um, on the basis of the determination that the Commission just made on the HRA, um, then the environmental uh, determination is appropriate. Uh, whether that becomes appropriate for planning purposes is a different discussion that is not the purview of the Commission. Uh, but given the conclusion of the HRA, then the, the Secretary of Interior Standard is being met by the proposed uh, parcel split. Therefore, it is categorically exempt as cited there. Uh, the certificate of appropriateness allows the split of the lot into three or the subdivision of the lot into three. And that's really what this next action is. Uh, it is required by code to be a public hearing. <clears throat> that means uh, you've opened the public hearing and now I'm giving the staff presentation when I finish. We'll give the applicant, uh, this time not the consultant, but the applicant opportunity to speak to the project if, so, if she so desires. After that, the commission would close the public hearing and discuss amongst themselves, uh, the, I mean, the presentation and discuss amongst themselves and then open it to the public for any comments at which point you will close the public session and the, council, the commission would then make a final determination on the certificate of appropriateness. We do recommend subject to what we now know is the HRS conclusion, uh, approval of the certificate of appropriateness. If there are no environmental impact uh, to the building or to the setting uh, or any of the issues that would have been previously considered as an impact, adverse impact, then allowing the parcel split becomes uh, a common um, occurrence that we believe would not harm the landmark property. And we therefore as staff recommend that the commission support the certificate of appropriateness. I will be glad to answer any questions you may have. 
Any commissioners have any questions of Ike at this time? Why include the HAPS requirement? Well, um, I, I think the owner might agree with Dana and I do agree with Dana that there is some degree of settings impact as addressed in the HRA and a typical situation when you have an impact that cannot be mitigated to a less than significant or in this case, using the logic that you presented, you know, that the setting was not obviously the most critical thing when it got relocated. Maybe there was in those days during the discussion, they said, okay, you gotta plant some trees to make it look more like a farmhouse. Uh, but that part of it, since we don't have any written records to show that fact, that part of it would to a certain extent as then appropriately points out, uh, would be affected. And what would have been an appropriate mitigation is a uh, typical uh, you know, presentation of what the setting is as of today, uh, pictures of the surrounding, and then uh, having that as a record to keep because the previous uh, subdivisions, no one thought to do that. So we don't really know uh, what the setting had been and how it's grown to where it is now and how it's going to be changing when you are adding uh, two houses uh, to the new proposed lots, that would involve removal of some of those trees and outhouses and structures. Um, that would definitely do change, uh, as Commissioner Larry appropriately pointed out, the recreation to some extent of that setting that it had originally. It never did ac accomplish the full goal and I don't think, you know, I concur with you all. I don't think the intent was it to accomplish the full goal of being a farmhouse forever. Um, you know, things evolve. But as the changes occur, we document what we have for the record. And folks like the Hardy Weber Museum do display those things every now and then to show folks five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years from now that this is what that used to be. And that's the appropriate mitigation. And if then I wanted to stand by his original proposal, uh, that actually is the appropriate mitigation to address that. I, I think I would just reiterate the same thing I've said before. It's been there less than 50 years. The, the setting is not historic. I don't think there's any need to do have documentation for a non-historic setting. Other commissioners with questions uh, for, for Ike before we hear from Ms. Silman. Uh, I don't think, oh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, Commissioner One. Um, I, I just want to comment on the, uh, his, for the historical, you know, uh, site, I, we want to increase the Increase the value of uh, uh, a property or building, and that people want to do that. If if the process make it so hard for like this house has been on the market for more than a year, I um because I'm going to houses, so I know this one. I just feel as the market you know going so hard, but this house just sit there won't be able to sell, which means there's something no right for this house. Maybe you know I just feel uh in order to that people want to join, you know, make the house be uh, his, uh, identify as a historical uh, building or site. Uh, you need to have uh, some incentive. If if we if the whole process make the um, owner, you know, more trouble to get any like uh, uh, modified uh, building or anything like that. So I just feel um, we need to make the some incentive for people. The owner wants to join. They want to to make the house, you know, be historical. So I just feel maybe the maybe the process, maybe some something needs to um, promoting the historical site. That's how I feel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wan. Uh, other other comments or questions for for Ike before we hear from Mrs. Silman. I don't, don't see any. So um, I'll turn it over, uh, Ms. Silman, if you have anything to add to, uh, to the discussion on, on this point.
Uh, Mrs. Silman, do you have anything you'd like to add? Okay, um, so uh, with with that, um, if I miss someone, you don't have anything to, to add to, to the discussion following the outline that Ike presented, I think we can close um, the public hearing and um, I'll open it up for, for a commission discussion. Uh, we, ha we have a couple of attendees, I, I, I believe they are oh, members. Oh, I didn't see that. Do you? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking that they are with uh, Mr. Silman, so I don't know if they wish to speak on his behalf. And at this moment, the hand still standing is that of Richard uh, Meeks. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Meeks. Yes, I think Gene got cut off a while ago. I don't know what IT problem she's having, but she's gone, and I don't think she intended that. Yeah, I, I can I can see it looks like she's connected twice. I don't know if she's tried to connect on her phone. Yeah, or... she's she's bounced on and off. And I, I see a lot of the few people that are involved disappearing, reappearing. I don't know what that's about, but I, I'm just concerned that she doesn't get her chance. And I'm, I'm a neighbor of hers. I know Josh. Hi, hi Josh. And I, I just am concerned that she won't get the last little bit of input because she's been through a lot, you know, trying to sell this house after she finally concluded it was too big for her after Arnie died. So that's my input. Appreciate that. And actually with that, uh, perhaps uh, to give uh, Mrs. Silman a little more time um, as she's maybe perhaps trying to get connected. Um, maybe I, if we could do a little modification, I, I could see, um, with the other attendees here, uh, I could see somebody else has their hand up, uh, Andy, Andy Calloway. So perhaps we might hear from some members of the public to give Miss Selman an opportunity to maybe um, uh, re reconnect or, or, or get, get back on online as it were, or at least be able to yeah. call. I'll ping her. Uh, that's Andy Calloway. I, I yes, heard, yeah. yes. <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, I'm Andy Calloway, Jean and Arnie's daughter. Um, and my mom was, was having a little trouble unmuting. Um, the only thing that I think would make sense to add is just a little context on the designation of the house as a historical landmark initially. Um, I know there was a lot of discussion around that and I, I certainly agree with everyone's assessment so far and the, you know, the diligent review um, and really the, the decision or the thought that the setting is not relevant to the home itself, but just to give a little bit of context about how it happened originally, um, <laughs> the, the house, my parents bought the house, um, I think in like 1976, and they, it was about to be, it was just left by the side of the freeway. It was completely decrepit. And um, my parents, on a whim kind of found this old house and decided to move it to the only property that was available, which was this 11 acre parcel. Um, and the reason that the historical landmark designation was actually even um, ever in play was simply because they were in the process of restoring it. And when they brought out one of the building inspectors to um, approve one of the projects that they were doing, um, the banister in that area of the stairwell was too low to meet the building codes. And so my dad at the time was kind of going back and forth with the city around, you know, how to, how to deal with that. And they really said, well, the only option that you might have would be to request that it's designated as a historical property. So my dad opted to do that um, so that he could retain the banister in the, in the format that it was supposed to be in the house. You know, the banisters in the old days were a little lower. Um, and so it was really at their request that the property was even indicated as a historical landmark to begin with. So I just wanted to, I know my mom is um, kind of in and out right now just with the technology challenges, but um, 
as Rick mentioned, she really has been through so much and is trying to do her very best to um, remain on the property actually and um, kind of make her way through these challenges. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that at least that little tidbit of history was, was heard and documented. Well, well, thank you. Um, are there any, is there anybody else in attendance who uh, would like to offer any comments? And I can, um, can see Miss uh, Miss Silva may have still have some difficulty difficulty connecting. Um, I'm not certain how how well we can uh, can address that, but I I think actually she can she can speak now. It looks like oh, oh she okay great great Miss Silva. If you do, is there anything else you want to add? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we oh. can. <laughs> it's been off and on with my phone saying waiting, waiting, waiting. But uh, I'm very no. Sorry. Um, I'm with uh, Mr. Heckman. I'm pretty convinced that the um, setting has little to do with the historical nature of the house, especially given that it was moved uh, from the original setting right next to the freeway. And actually at the time, I only recall one tree on the original lot uh, and everything here uh, other than the volunteers has been planted by my husband. Nothing else to say. Useful, useful context. Thank you, thank you, um, Mr. Meeks. You, you have your 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 hand up. I, I see again. So I want to be certain you get an opportunity to to speak. I just wanted to make sure that she got her word in there. Hi, Jean. Hi, Rick. <laughs> All right. Very very good. So um, with that, I, I I do want to turn it back to to the commission discussion and and deliberation. Um, Regarding the, the two actions, um, is is the proposed project categorically exempt, and um, do we vote to approve the certificate of appropriateness? Uh, any, any commissioners want to um, uh, have any comments uh, regarding that, or any additional questions to ask uh, Miss Silman now that we have her on the line, um, or or Ike, um, or, or um, well, I'll leave it at that. Any other commissioner comments, questions? I would propose we remove uh, from the, 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 con the conditions, uh, the third category, the HABs requirement. And I would ask Ike of the fourth requirement that it says the property owner shall relocate a, a sign. Is there actually a sign on site already? Or are we proposing that they pay for the creation of a sign? Um, yeah, should I... I... <laughs> I'm sorry to say I haven't verified the location of the sign, but there should be a sign on uh, uh, placed on the property's fence that um, as you ride your bike along there, you might have seen it, you know, which the commission had placed when um, Mr. Toramino did their subdivision. Part of the mitigation is, uh, as you aptly mentioned, that most folks when they are riding their bike there do not know that that's a landmark property. So. Uh, the commission required uh, Toramino to provide a landmark sign that was placed on the fence. Um, that was done, but I don't know if it's still there or if it's been vandalized or removed. Uh, and even if this lot is subdivided, uh, that sign would be on a different lot if it's still there. But if it's, if it's not there, it would have been nice to have that sign back on the property, the actual property where this would be located. I, I don't believe I've ever seen a sign there. Nor have From, I. Yeah. Ditto. I, I, I would think if, if, if there's a requirement for a sign, I mean, I believe, I believe the city has paid for most of the landmark signs. I don't think we require the property owners to pay for them. Is, is that correct? We placed on city owned landmark signs. We haven't done, I mean, landmark properties. We haven't done it for private. Then we have if six, we haven't... six city six city landmark properties uh, that we signed, but none of the private ones have been signed. If we haven't required it for other private properties, then I wouldn't suggest we require it for this one. That's fine. Uh, other comments from from the commissioners regarding the uh, 
findings and conditions of approval. Anyone disagree with Commissioner Ickman as to um, the HABS condition, number three? Agree. Hi, Mr. this is Commissioner Montgomery. Sorry, my video is not working tonight, but I concur with Commissioner Ickman. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Montgomery and Commissioner Lowry. Man, we're having technical difficulties. We've, we've gotten virtually through this entire process without, without issues. And here we're coming to the end, we have issues. Um, other, other comments uh, from commissioners regarding the conditions of approval? Any issues you want to raise? Well, I believe Commissioner Hickman is also asking that uh, the signage uh, landmark be removed at number four. So it's going to ah, be number three correct. and four. Correct, three and four. Yes, thank you, Ike, for, for, uh, for clarifying that. Yes, Commissioner Hickman did indeed suggest that. Uh, so any concerns or comments regarding the commissioners regarding the removal of the landmark identification conditions of approval? Anything else from the commissioners? All right, well then I will accept a motion to uh, determine that the property is categorically exempt and two, to um, approve the conditions of approval as suggested for amendment by Commissioner Rickman, specifically removal of items three and four. I'll accept a motion on those. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Hickman. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Lowry. All right, going back around the horn again, Commissioner Hickman. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Lowry. Aye. Commissioner Van Meter. Aye. Commissioner Montgomery. Aye. Commissioner Wan. Aye. And I am an I as well. Uh, good luck with the property. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you thank you very much. All right, so that closes item 6A. And now we'll come to business items. Um, we'll start with item 7A regarding the um, College Park Historic District Management Plan. Um, Ike and I are on, on the hook for this presentation, but I'll let Ike, I'll let Ike start. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've received a revised estimate from uh, Mike, Michael Gravigilia uh, Associates on the design guidelines, uh, part of that proposal. Hi. Okay. Um, I'm... I... Okay. But let me, give me one second. Let me remove those that should be gone by now. Jane, your project is done, so you can have a good night, okay? Thank yes. you. Thank you. All right. Give no. Me one second. Give me one second. Let me mute. Good. Okay. I think we should be good by now. My video. Um, I, I think we should be good. <laughs> I, I, you. I, you stopped my video. Oh, yours? I didn't touch yours. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't. You won't be able to see me then. Okay, let me. It's, it's fine. You go ahead. <laughs> it's really. We don't, we don't need to be labor the Okay. All right, go ahead, Mike. Okay, yeah. Yours um, should be working. I didn't touch yours. Okay. All right, um, the current estimate we received is approximately 15,000, um, but there is a caveat that if the commission is to participate, that cost might go a little higher. What we are looking at is sort of um, minimal update of the DPRs for each college park property. And then on the basis of the information received, which is basically the crater defining features of each home, uh, that would help inform how the design principles will be derived for the college park. We still do have the $5,000 from CLG grant 
uh, meaning that the city would come up with uh, the remaining approximately $9,000 uh, to make up for the difference. We are also looking towards the commission to volunteer with uh, the 40% uh, match for the 5,000 uh, for the CLG grant. My sense is we need to move forward uh, as a group. You know, the commission needs to be able to discuss uh, tonight whether to form a subcommittee that could help with the DPR updates so that we can get that done as uh, quickly as possible so that Gara Vigilia Associates would be able to proceed with the actual work of design guidelines and holding meetings with the neighborhood. Uh, the proposal calls for four neighborhood meetings. Um, we think that would be adequate. Uh, between the first two, we'll be able to learn, uh, as Commissioner Larry has previously mentioned, whether the College Park neighborhood is still interested in having uh, some guidance as to what they should do when alterations, remodeling, or demolition is proposed in their neighborhood. Um, I think that's the synopsis of that. Scott, I don't know what you think. I think I think that that captures it. Um, the what what Mike has tried to do is is craft a scope that would enable us to get to the point where there's something tangible, a, a set of guidelines, a set of suggested guidelines for the engagement of the College Park uh, property owners. That's going to 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 do that. Ultimately, will mean privileging the integrity in terms of updating the DPR forms. We'll ultimately mean working on updating the DPR forms to better reflect, um, to better identify, excuse me, the character defining features of the neighborhood and address any potential integrity issues. Kind of that effort in terms of updating the DPR forms at this point is not, is not scoped or intended to cover uh, any potential associations of historic persons uh, with the property. It really is going to be architecturally focused. So for, for those of you keeping score at home, really a, a, a C argument here, um, which given the prior evaluations of, of the um, College Park neighborhood, the one, the original designation back in the 80s, the original survey, I think back in 1980, then the update in 1996, um, they all call out the architecture. So the focus is really going to be driven on the architecture. And where Mike's going to, is looking for our assistance is he's going to come up with a survey methodology. And we're looking at about 45 properties that based on survey methodology, getting a couple of us out there to collect some of the information necessary to update the DPR forms appropriately. And then from those DPR forms, divine, as Ike was saying, those uh, principles that are going to inform the design guidelines and that are going to be hashed out in a series of meetings. Um, I, my feeling about this is this is our best chance to get to do a couple things, not the least of which being uh, to get uh, a set of guidelines that maybe the property owners uh, would be willing to get behind. At, at, a, at a minimum, though, I think it'll enable us through this effort supported through the CLG grant for us to get a, a firmer sense of the temperature of the property owners and to give us experience in how we deal with other districts going forward. And, and when I say us, I'm just not talking about this commission, but I'm also talking about the city. Because as we've talked about before um, on numerous occasions over the past year plus, there is more than one historic district um, here in, in the city. And College Park is the only one that's been designated and it lacks a district ma management plan. These guidelines will get us towards that district management plan. It won't get us all the way because the district management plan will also require a map and a couple other things as well. But the design guidelines are really the fundamental part of that. So getting something like that to the College Park residents, I think would ultimately be beneficial. And it's gonna, in order to really do that, we're going to need a little more, more participation by members of the commission. I don't necessarily know if we need to form uh, yet another subcommittee. We do have a College Park subcommittee, but we may be looking for additional support uh, from commissioners who could take a house or two um, just so that we can get that information, get the information to Mike Garavaglia so that he can update the DPR forms, so that we can assist in updating the DPR forms um, so that he can really focus on the uh, design guidelines themselves 
and presenting what I think is has kind of been lacking in, in, in our outreach to to uh, the, the community. Uh, and that is a clear set of guidelines that emphasize the benefits that are really going to say, this is what you're getting for all of this, rather than, I think, which is the, the, the natural standpoint of a lot of property owners is seeing the negatives, what they can't do. You know, the design guidelines are going to be something concrete that we, we talked about at these public hearings that are going to spell out what people can do. And what that can do is about preserving this neighborhood that I think many of the property owners enjoy and, and, and wish to do so. So we are going to be needing a little bit more uh, commissioner support. Now, we're going to need to provide that anyway for some of the matching. Um, but I certainly am committed to doing a couple of houses and I'm hoping some other commissioners will, will volunteer to do that as well. Um, if at the end of the day, confronting the possibility that this ends up not going anywhere, at least in terms of the community, uh, the neighborhood ultimately decides much like Old North and Old East that they don't wanna be a formal historic district. Well, then that's still helpful to us too, because with the said design guidelines, perhaps that becomes the basis for something like a conservation district. That's a little bit different than an historic district, um, much a bit more like Old North and Old East, but we would then have a set of criteria too that in, in the event that College Park decides to become something like a conservation district rather than remain a historic district, then this commission and staff would have a set of internal guidelines focused on the character defining features that I think could help guide decision making on projects that come before the commission and before city staff in the future. So I see multiple benefits from this approach from frankly an approachable cost. This is an opportunity for us to move this forward in a way that we haven't been really been able to do. And I'm very eager for us to get behind it. So that's, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer questions about from commissioners and, and I'm certain like too to answer any specifics that um, may be outstanding. But I, I would like tonight to get a commitment from a couple of us to do some of that uh, survey work um, or assist Garavaglia in some of that survey work. And uh, if, if I may add, we we also have received, and I shared it with a few of the uh, College Park subcommittee members, uh, the building permit history uh, for College Park from inception to present, when I say present as of last week, Friday. <laughs> so we, we've provided that. And I think that's more than enough, you know, to assist with uh, anything that Mike might need. What we think might take time, which we don't have, is trying to find the history of every single person that might have occupied the building and see if there was any um, significance those folks might provide to the city of Davis to warrant uh, evaluating their properties from the standpoint of contributions to the city. Um, we do know of one person that lives there uh, that was a council member, mayor, and also an assemblywoman, uh, but we don't know of any others. Uh, and at, at this point, we think that that may be an effort that can wait so that we can work with the design guideline because going through that history of occupancy might just mean uh, significant time constraint on getting, get, getting to move forward with the design guidelines. But if we can look at the uh, building history, which we now have, uh, we see where alterations might have occurred, appropriate or inappropriate alterations, that could help you know, in defining what are the character defining features of each building and what remains and what doesn't remain. Right, and it, it'll, it'll give us something to, to work from too in the future. You know, as we're thinking about university estates, as we're thinking about um, uh, you know, potentially even village homes, um, it, it'll give us some of that. And so, um, yeah, I, I really, I, I think this is our, our best um, attempt yet to sort of move this forward. So um, as I said, I, I'm, I'm committed to doing um, some of the survey work. Um, I am on the College Park subcommittee. Um, I understand that not everyone has that ability, but it would be nice if we could get a couple other commissioners on board for, for doing that work um, once, uh, once, once Mike gets approval from, from the city. And, and I, my understanding is that that approval um, is imminent. I mean, it's, it's, is it, is it, it's really a function of, 
if, if we don't have any major issues with the approach as has been outlaid, that the city's going to go forward with that. Is that, is that a fair, um, is that a fair characterization? Uh, um, Commissioner Larry has had his hand up for a while. Could he yeah. speak then while I think, think for an answer to that question? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, Commissioner Larry. I didn't see you. Uh, yeah, I can speak really slow so you have more time to think. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've looked at that sp uh, spreadsheet of uh, permit history and um, it's, it's pretty useful. I, if it goes, the, I think the earliest one in there is 1957 or 54 and um, seems to be fairly complete. It doesn't really describe the projects very well, but if, 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 if it gives us a, but it has the permit number if so in, in in case in the case of more recent uh permit applications we can um perhaps look at the uh actually documents on file with the city that would help um but i think it's i think it's a useful starting point and it doesn't look like it's insurmountable task i think that um evaluation of those of the buildings um can go pretty steadily uh forward with that with that list especially if we can trust the list to be complete. And then, then we know that we we're, we're, we just have to track down those items. And that out of, there's probably 150 um, building permits on there, but but there, some houses don't have any and some houses have quite a few. So I, I think that we can use that as a tool. Um, I'm perfectly happy to do a, um, a, a great deal of the um, building assessment work um and so um we just need to talk about a structure for doing that and reporting out right um, and, 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 i'm sorry just to be clear uh, we're in this case what are we looking for mike to provide that structure and how we sort of internal deadlines and stuff so that even won't even fall to us um so it'll just be a matter of us sort of sliding in to to meet what they what they need um, for for specific and it might be as you say some some buildings don't have any building permits and, and a visual inspection may may um, tend to confirm the fact that there has been any alterations so we move on you know we can triage as it were not not every building is going to require the same level of effort to update the DPR forms I'm sorry I just wanted to, to just get in there go ahead I'm sorry yeah the initial triage can be done in a day easily um, and then we go back and look at the ones that appear to be meaningful um, if you know, some of the permits are for swimming pools. Some of them are for solar collectors. Um, so, you know, a lot of that we can cross those off. And other ones that are internal, like a kitchen model, we can we can cross off. Other ones that are um, in addition, it, it's pretty easy to ascertain whether those are in the front or the back. They're in the back, probably no big deal. So we might be only be down to maybe um, twenty that really need to be um, studied. And um, so, okay, so the other thing is, do we have a schedule for all this stuff? I'd like to see, you know, a timeline for who does what, when. That's what, that's what Mike is gonna provide. That's when I was saying that survey methodology. Okay, uh, so that's, that's item number one on his list, on his proposal, I guess. It's just I to would, kind of make a work plan. Is that right? Right, right. Um, you know, at, at this point he's provided a, which, which you've seen, uh, he's provided a general, a general scope, um, and yes, I think getting that that um, getting from him what that survey methodology is, what what do they need internally? I mean, it all it all backs out from there. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that would be the first order of business. Another thing I recall, I recall someone saying that the five thousand dollars had to be expended by September. Is that correct? That's it's my record. Mike, right? If so, if so, we got to move fast. Um, some sometimes grants require that the money actually be expended and not just uh, committed. So yeah, yes, it has to be expended uh, by uh, no later than September thirty first. Um, okay, so so um, that would suggest maybe Garavaglia does his uh, phase one work immediately and bill for it so that we can, uh, and maybe it's a separate agreement, just so that we can, you know, use that money and have a work plan uh, and not lose that 5,000 bucks. Commissioner Van Meter has her hand off for a while. 
Well, wait, actually, I, before, b b b before um, I just want to be get clarity. So how quickly is the city poised to move on this given the time constraints? My, my understanding is that it was, it would be pretty fast. Does that still remain the case? Did you say you didn't see her hand? She has her hand up. Oh, no, I, I, I did. I just wanted to circle back to, to the question about what the, what the timing is from the city's perspective. Um, I mean, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it, that's a good question. And Sherry has dropped off. I wish she was here to assist us with that. And hopefully when I talk to her during our planning staff meeting tomorrow, um, I may be able to um, ascertain where we are with things. Okay, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, Commissioner Van Meter. Um, I just wanted to confirm if uh, if we're being tasked with collecting you know, field photographs and field notes to provide to Mike, or are we also, um, you know, the commissioners, are we going to be preparing the updated DPR forms? The actual distribution of work between those two items, which are which are both integral to updating the uh, the DPR forms. Um, I don't think that we Mike's address that, and I would anticipate that would be sort of part of outlining the methodology and the, and the work plan, because um, it's 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 a fair point. At this point, our discussion is focused on what contributions the commission can provide meaningfully to assist them. So it may be at the end of the day that maybe the best thing we can do is do the first part of that, do the photo documentation, write up some field notes, and then hand that off or um, with maybe some actual contributions to DPR forms themselves. Um, I was really envisioning from the discussion we had with Mike that it would be the first, that, that there'd be commissioners out there taking photographs, doing some field notes, um, and definitely doing that, that part of it. I, I think so too. Uh, and one thing I wanted to add, you know, he's asking, should his format of the design guidelines be similar to the Davis uh, downtown traditional residential design guidelines for the conservation of Valley district? Or would we want him to come up with something differently? He is comfortable doing what we are used to, which is the Davis downtown DDTRN uh, design guideline. But he's also questioning, asking us to provide him an input as to what we prefer. Do we want to see something similar to what we have now, or do we want to have him give us something new? In terms of the design guideline, uh, uh, how the documentation appears. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm a little on that issue. I'm, uh, I'm of two minds. I mean, the, the, the utility of the downtown design guidelines is something we all know. Um, it, it has some longevity in the community. They've been around for a fair amount of time, but it is for a conservation district. And I'm not certain that there's a one size fits all approach. I mean, if, if, it, was, if it was the case of that, if there's some general template of it, then I, I think that's fine. But I also wouldn't want that to become like I said, a one size fits all, especially given how diverse the College Park is versus other, other places. I don't have an issue with it being a starting point. Um, and maybe there's some general language in there that's useful for continuity, but we are talking about something that's a little bit of a different beast. It's not a conservation district. We're ready, we're looking for historic district guidelines. Maybe those are a little bit different. Commissioner Fickman, I, I see you have your- If I heard correctly before, uh, Mike's on the hook for four public meetings. I just, I don't see that happening before the end of September, not meaningfully. That I, I can see a, a couple meetings, but it, it, during the summer, it doesn't seem like you can get four meetings. I would also say, go ahead, Ike. Sorry. Yeah, I think, you know, Commissioner Lowry pegged what we are trying to do. What we are hoping to do is, um, I think maybe this time when I say I'm, we are, I'm, I'm, we am referring to the chairperson, <laughs> Milton Bogana. I think what we're hoping to achieve is get his um, services encumbered, you know, get him returned okay. and let him say something, send us invoice for what amounts to that 5,000, as Commissioner Lowry mentions, so that we don't lose that funding. Uh, so that's, he, that's a beginning place, you know, 
Uh, but I don't think our, we are envisioning that he will finish the design guidelines and everything by September. Uh, I so think he, can, he can invoice for meetings that are going to happen later? Yeah, time. well, okay. Okay. well uh, with the work uh, he would be doing, we, we are looking at you know him being able to uh, have spent, based on what he's done, close to 5,000, you know, even if it means uh, arranging for the first introductory meeting, based on his fee estimate, we think that would get us uh, past that 5,000. And then we are able to then invoice that to the state for refund uh, prior to that S September deadline. But where a problem might occur is we do nothing. The deadline comes and goes, then we forfeit that 5,000. What it means in the future is if the city decides to apply for any grant from the state, we wouldn't be top priority. You know, we would be on a case by case basis if there are no other uh, jurisdictions seeking fund and there is extra fund left, they might give it to us. Otherwise we would not be considered seriously. I, I hear you. I, I think maybe, I mean, maybe he could reduce the number of meetings he's proposing to do by the end of September. And, and we could, I, I'm sure he could absorb $5,000 without doing four public meetings before the end of September. Um, yeah, but, I, I don't know that he, yeah, I think he, this is a template and, you know, the, the detailed outline is part of what he is proposing on his uh, item number one. Once we get a feel to what it is, you know, then he will actually put out a calendar of when things can be done. And that's something that he wants to work with us. Um, I think, you know, if, if there's a problem, I mean, I think you could probably do two meetings by the end of September, um, but he has to invoice for those, um, and the work has to be completed, he has to invoice for those in May after you be pay paid by the end of September as well. So that would it, likely two meetings this summer. Um, hopefully some people will show up because um, everybody's trying to take vacations now. Um, but, you know, two meetings, maybe he has to restructure his proposal so that there's two meetings and then two meetings is part of a, a later um, uh, component so that they can, it can be built separately um, and we can make use of the, all the front end money that we have. The, the, the grant money, I suppose, is, is the first to be spent. So right. let's have him restructure his, his proposal so that we can do that. And, um, and, and, and at the same time, set the stage for later work. But it could, I all think, could take a year. But we do have to burn through the initial five grand in, by September. I don't think, frankly, I don't think there's going to be any problem with him invoicing and getting the 5,000 invoiced and paid before September. So as long, so long, as, the, as, long as the city acts quickly, to get him under contract. Okay, I think so we're, whatever, whatever's preventing that from happening, we should address because we don't want any delays there. Well, as I said, he's going to- Ideally, we want him to start immediately and work through the summer. Right, and I, I, I think, you know, my sense is he's, he's interested in doing this, he's eager to do this. Uh, and, you know, as, as Ike was saying, hopefully get an update on the state perspective, because as a commission, we can't, you know, we, we can't sign the contract. Um, but I think if, if we can, I think you'll be, there's more enough, even with us contributing with in terms of survey work and assisting with updating DPR forms, there's more than enough work for, for his folks with just starting to put that together. I, I think they're going to want to lay eyes on some of this. It's not just going to be us doing the survey. You know, they'll, they'll spend that 5,000. I think so, so long as we, uh, my feeling would be so long as we get him under contract or and by we, I mean the city, uh, uh, certainly around the 4th of July. I think he'll he'll go through five thousand uh, dollars by August. Um, we don't I, know that, but you know, we don't know that. Yes, I don't, I don't, I don't know that, but yeah. he understands the score, and I don't think we need to worry about scheduling public, figuring he has to do these public meetings beforehand. There's more than enough work to be done, is all I'm saying, to the point where he will spend the five thousand, and then it'll be the rest that the city come up with to sort of to move that forward. Um, I, I'm not concerned with that in the slightest. Again, provided the city gets it, doesn't wait a month to get them under contract. Okay, I'm I'm ready to uh, start photography and and assessment um, starting like January. I mean July, maybe seventh. I could I okay. could start then, if if that's if that's useful. I think get, getting as many commissioners involved to keep this moving along is all to the good. 
whatever anybody can contribute. Like I said, I'm, I'm going to be participating as much as I can um, to, to do some photo documentation. So I know Commissioner Lowry, you can. Is there, Commissioner Hickman, did, you had something to say. When we did the 2015 survey, we did an open call for volunteers through the Davis Enterprise, which is how I got in this commission and how I landed my current job. So I, I, I don't know that we need to do a call to the whole city, but maybe we propose to the College Park uh, neighborhood that they participate in this. And I also just, since I had to sit through two hours of Brown Act meeting requirements, if we start adding additional commissioners volunteering for the subcommittee, do we run into a problem with the Brown Act? And is there a way to use some sort of open call for volunteers to get around making this a, a quorum? I'm glad you brought that up. Is, uh, um, I regret bringing it up. Yeah, I, I, it's something I was gonna address on the eight. Uh, but since it's brought up, the concept we are looking at here is not really a subcommittee of per se as much as volunteers of commission uh, who can contribute to, to the survey process, uh, either by looking to the building permit history, uh, as Commissioner Larry has uh, stated, you know, the, maybe there are about 20 of them as he's found out that may need the additional work, you know, that can be looked up in our city hall uh, records to see more about those and have information on them. So that's something that can take some time and that person will log their time also uh, for the CLG matching fund. And I can make that available. I think we are not looking at this as a subcommittee, but as uh, a, you know, individual commissioners who are willing to volunteer their time uh, for the purposes of one, uh, getting the commission's uh, contribution in, in terms of matching fund uh, documented as well as assisting with the progression or facilitation of the process uh, with the help of uh, our hire, if we hire, uh, when we hire, uh, Mr. Gravigelas and Associates uh, to do the work. So I'm not seeing it as a subcommittee work as much as, as individual commissioners volunteering freely to participate in any form that they think they want to participate. And then I will send out the form, uh, the volunteer forms to each commissioner that will, will be willing to say tonight, yeah, I want to be part of that so that you can familiarize yourself on documentation of your hours and time. A monetary uh, equivalency because That's what we really need what we really need is when we it's not just uh, mr gravigilia expending the five thousand but also we showing at the same time that we have provided the matching yeah. so, so we can we can be in, you know we can't uh, go to the state to to ask for the five thousand without proof that we also have matched the forty percent so that, that just reminds me, we have to really have to document our time. So, yes, so yes, and I, I can send that form out in yeah, a, yeah. If, if I know who is volunteering because your work of volunteer is just gonna be you logging your hours and your work product coming to me and then I passing it to Mr. Gravigilia and Associates. Right, well, I yes. can send the form out. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you, Commissioner Lowry. Maybe in the interest of time, maybe the best thing to do, or let me ask, would the best thing be to do is for individual commissioners just to contact you saying we're interested in participating and you'll Yeah, send to avoid this ad hoc appearance of a subcommittee because if the commission uh, did take action on it in that format, it might appear to be an ad, ad hoc com a committee when it's not. Hey, I'd, I'd like to suggest, Ike, that you, you, at least initially, that you're like the project manager for this and you dole out um, tasks, and then, then we can reorganize later on, perhaps. So we do need to get started. Yeah, if people, you know, if commissioners email me that they are interested, then I can actually make that happen. Okay, so maybe we leave it, leave it at that, um, not, not to foreclose any discussion or any of the questions commissioners would have, but at least in terms of participation. And if you're interested, and I, I encourage you, if you could spend a little time, it would be great. Um, to, to contact Ike and yeah, we're, there, we do have that form. Um, and I'm, I appreciate Commissioner for bringing up the Brown Act uh, issue. Uh, um, it's a fair one to, to raise. Uh, other commissioner comments on this business item or questions? Am I missing anybody, Ike? I'm not seeing anybody. No, I'm not seeing anyone else. And... Okay, so then uh, just in the interest of time, moving along uh, to 7B, Ike, you had some comments about the bike lane signage. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yep. 
my understanding is um, the funding, uh, it has been budgeted to fund the signage for the bike lanes. Um, and before I go out and ask our former commissioner, uh, Rich Rifkin, who volunteered when he was leaving the commission that he will continue to work on this. And my understanding has work, was working on the side previously with our former uh, city employee, Bob Bowen, but both of them are no longer with city services. So I wanted to make sure that commissioners who may be interested in doing this uh, have the full chance to say, yes, I want to volunteer and do this. If there is no volunteer, then if the commission authorizes me, I can reach out to commissioner, uh, former commissioner uh, Rifkin and ask if he's still interested in, in participating and see if he can, because I know he's done a lot of research on this. Um, may probably, I haven't talked to him since he left the commission, but I could reach out and see where his head lies on if there is no takers from the commission. But before I reach out to him, I wanted to make sure that the commission knows that we uh, discussed this as a commission before the joint council session and the city management uh, believe that council has directed the signage to go forward uh, to acknowledge the bike, original four original bike lanes and the envisioned eight signage on each uh, beginning segment or ending segment, depending on where you are traveling of those roadway segments or bike lane segment um, is being budgeted for. And if council adopts the budget and that money remains, then we should act uh, very expeditedly to get those signs in place. And since council showed interest in it, and I just wanted to make sure if there are any commissioners or commission member that wishes to take this on, then we can have that ad hoc committee of one or two uh, to work on it. But if there isn't, then does, is it the commission's will to reach out to former commissioner Rifkin to see if he's still interested in assisting us? I'd, I'd be happy to work on this but I would like to work with uh, Rifkin on it. So if we can ask him to um, contribute to some time to it, then um, I'll do it, what needs to be done from like inside and he can do what he can do. I'm sure he's already thought through this already. So it'd be silly not to engage him. Um, um, in fact, we, I think we used to think that he was working on it. So uh, I'm sure he's gotten some distance. Plus he, he's, He's done similar signage before for the city, so it's easy. It'll be easy for him. Okay. Is there any other volunteer, or is he going to be a volunteer of one? Uh, I'll, I'll volunteer um, as well, um, just because I, I worked with um, the subcommittee that that um, worked on the national register nomination, and, and and in case Rich, for whatever reason, is unable. To, to participate or maybe not participate as fully. I think it would be at a minimum, it'd be great to sit down and talk to him. I agree with you, Alan, there, there may be, he may have thought through a lot of these ideas. And so I think it'd be wrong not to use him as a resource, but just in case he can't provide a fuller commitment, I, I don't think it should fall just on you. So I'm, I'm happy yeah. to join you. Yeah, I can do I can do the graphic design, but you know, I, sus I would, would not be surprised if Rich has already, um, you know, drafted out the text and selected photos and things like that. Yeah. You're, okay. You're, I will reach out to him. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, anything else in the bike lanes? Not from me. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on to item seven uh, C, ordinance update. Yes. I simply wanted to let the commission know that this is not um, sitting uh, idle somewhere. We had sent the ordinance update, that's the HRMC ordinance and also the college park draft um, overlay ordinance, historic overlay ordinance to the city attorney for review. It has been with the city attorney for uh, a couple of weeks now. And we hope to hear back before the next commission meeting. Um, and then we will bring it back to you with any changes or edits or suggestions from the city attorney for final review before we can finalize it and send it to council. Very good. Thank you for the update. Any any questions or comments from commissioners about this? No. All right. Moving along, item eight. 
development subcommittee staff update. So um, these are related to potential projects inquiries addressed by staff. Um, 20, 238 G Street, Ike? Yes, that, um, that's the only item that we worked during this time frame. Uh, 238 uh, is a property that for some odd reason uh, got left out when the commission was reviewing the conservation of Valet district. And there have been a couple of inquiries what to do with that. And we have uh, the help of a consultant who is looking on either doing a site specific historic resources analysis or just a field survey to give us an input on that. So once that is done, our uh, hopes is to share that with the commission. But I just wanted to let you know that there has been inquiries as to what that property is, historically speaking. Isn't that the PDQ building? Yes. Well, you know, I think it's well known that they plan to redevelop that property. And uh, that might be the reason for the inquiry. Yeah, I don't, you know, I can't believe that. Okay, yeah. Wait, 238 G Street is the PDQ? I think no. so. No, that's Cat Mount. G, G Street oh. is Cat Marie. Oh, okay. that's Cat Mount. Yeah. Right. right. And, and this, this, this is. on F. Cat Marie is, was the original Davis Hardware. Um, yeah, it's the Ander Anderson, Anderson, Anderson family. Anderson, on Anderson's don't, they're, they're in, intending to tear down the, the newer building to the east, but they plan to retain the Cat Marie building. Yeah, it, actually, I'm confusing the whole thing, but but the whole my understanding of the inquiry re revolves around potential redevelopment if it's not a historic building, uh, and if it is, you know, what options? But until we see what this resource person, historical resources person's analysis is, I wouldn't be able to share anything because I don't know what they will find out. So we would know more once something comes out. Right. Could could you share? I uh, do. You, can you share who the consultant's name is? Or or I have no idea who this person is. <laughs> the inquiry the inquiry came through other planners, and I was um, involved by simply asking, you know, do you know anything about this? Was it part of the survey that the commission did? Is it part of the update? And I researched, and I couldn't find anything on it, and I was thanked for my services. And since we wanted to keep record of anything that dealt with historic resources, so I decided to include it. I, I, if I recall, you contacted me like last year in March about this property that the Anderson family was looking to redevelop this. And we made some initial inquiries into it in 2013. It was listed as being a, they didn't call it as a resource, but they said it was an important downtown building and it was distinguished architecture. And I made some initial looks at it and said it hadn't really been changed since then. And we didn't, we didn't follow up further from there. So what I'm hearing you saying is that the Anderson family has now hired a outside consultant to do a additional. I, I don't know who, I don't know who is hiring. Frankly, I don't know who's hiring. The, the, the whole situation is really not quite clear to me. I, I just wanted to bring it to the attention of the commission that there is an effort to further analyze the building in terms of historic resources as to who is paying for it or if it's being paid for or if it's being done freely. I don't know yet. And uh, when, um, when I'm supposed to know more, then I will let the commission know. I, 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 just to restrict me, your, your concern was just, or, or question was, it, it, is this something it, the commission should be doing? Well, I, I mean, there's no reason for the commission to do it versus somebody else. It, I, I looked, I took a look at it in March of last year, and it, it's, it wasn't called out as a as a merit resource, but it it stood real potential to be one. I mean, it's it's that's a significant what the, building in downtown. Yeah. yeah, that's what the 2003 analysis, you know, found, right. and and Commissioner Hickman, as you accurately mentioned, you know, um, the unofficial thoughts of the commission is that might be the case still. However, if there is a political inclination to make sure that that site could not be redeveloped as envisioned, like you know, involving demo and avoiding focus here and things like that, maybe a, a neutral third party might be uh, able to look at that. And then whatever decision is made by that individual still would have to come back to the commission pursuant to our ordinance, at least for the time being, 
uh, until the form-based code is adopted, uh, would have to come to the commission for advisory input. I, I believe it's only when the form-based code is adopted that they don't need to do that anymore. But, but at this time frame, uh, any historical resources analysis would have to come back to the commission. Yeah, and, and I, I not I mean, minding I who did it. Yeah, not minding. I think who it's did gonna it. be a hard call. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I I just wanted to bring it to the attention because it's part of what we agreed to do, um, and that's all I'm doing. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I, I just think it's just a little bit of curiosity on everyone's part. I don't think there's, um, um, you know, I don't think any of us care who's paying for it. Um, the question of just understanding what status is and getting some clarity, I think is. is yeah, all. I mean, that's all they are trying to do is get clarity on what they believe should be the historical resources designation, if any or none, for the property and the, whoever this person or persons or group or firm that may be looking at it, you know, whenever they do finish the report and if it's public information, then it would come before the commission, unless if the form based code is adopted before then. Right. I mean, it's identified as a contributor and a resource in the survey. <laughs> so I think that should be fairly clear to whoever's doing the research. You can let it drop. The, the, whoever it is has that information. Yeah. Whether it, they it's, concur with that finding um, is what we have to wait to find out. Yeah, sure. I, I would just say, I, I recall being a really gray area that, that the, the 2003 survey was enthusiastic about it, but there was no further action on it. So. I, I don't, it hasn't been designated, but I, I agree with Aaron that it's, it's been identified as important. Okay. All right. Um, anything else on, on this informational item? No, that's it. Just the only item we had during this, I don't believe the subcommittee had anything else. Yeah. Okay. And uh, now moving on to item number nine, the, the standing uh, subcommittee. Um, I've lost track, but I think I do think we want to get this on the record. Commissioner Montgomery, you are not on the downtown plan update subcommittee. Is that right? Yes, we've said that several times. Unfortunately, I keep using the same <laughs> agenda. Also, also, these are not standing subcommittees. I also sat through the very long Brown Act webinar and submitted yes. the form. They are ad hoc committees with temporary purposes and limited in time. So I think we should definitely not be putting them in public agendas as standing subcommittees. Agreed. And uh, my apologies for <laughs> using the same agenda. Uh, uh, the minutes reflect what we did previously, but the agenda didn't reflect it. And I think you are correct. It would not, we shouldn't be having these on the agenda anymore, given what we now know based on the city attorney's call uh, regarding ad hoc committees. Right. I, I think so we should. Ad hoc or okay? You can say ad hoc. That's totally fine. Standings okay. is not okay. Okay, okay, let's change them to ad hoc. Okay, gotcha. I mean, unless someone else has a different interpretation from the webinar. No, I, I, I agree. I, I think we should list them, but they shouldn't be called standing. And we also struck the uh, goals work plan and the Elmwood subcommittee in the last meeting, but they haven't come off this one. Yes, no. it's correct in the minutes, not correct on the agenda. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, um, all right, so uh, moving right along as we get towards the end here, I think um, item number 10, uh, brief announcements from staff, commissioner and liaisons. Ike, do you have any other announcements? No, thank you. Okay, I, I just have one very brief one. Um, about two weeks ago, uh, I believe, my memory fails me, the chairs of all of the Davis commissions had a meeting with the uh, city council's uh, subcommittee on commissions. So the subcommittee on commissions met with the chairs of the commissions. Um, this was uh, in part, well, not in part, this was uh, motivated by some suggestions that have come from the community, which some of you may be aware of, uh, specifically in an October, 2020 letter that identified um, some, some issues with the commission process. Um, and so this prompted some changes on the, on the city's part, uh, not the least which being that they've been trying to create a greater diversity among uh, the commissions. Um, that's why they've actually been pushing to have more students uh, from, from UC Davis participate. 
um, and, and get them on commission as well as provide a greater array of, of voices. Um, the, the meeting among the commissioners and the subcommittee was, I will say, very educational. Um, uh, I think that there's a tendency of all the commissions to kind of, we, we have our blinders on, we're, we're doing what we're doing, and we, we, we tend to think all of our problems are our own. Let me reassure my fellow commissioners that other commissions sometimes feel like they're not listened to as well. Um, it's just, it's not just us. Um, but the, the, the meeting itself was, was very good to hear that and to also get a better sense of what all the other commissions are doing. Um, I for one was very much in favor of more um, joint efforts among the commissions. Um, and that's an idea that's been being kicked around. Uh, for instance, I think it would be very good for our commission to liaise more frequently and directly and consistently with the planning commission. It's something that doesn't really ever happen. Um, but since our work and this tonight's meeting is an exemplar of that, since our work so often feeds or contributes in some way to the planning process, it seems to me having some sort of joint committees or subcommittees may make sense in the future. So that may be something that's coming. Um, the upshot of all this is that there will be continuing meetings among the, the chairs of the commissions um, and, and, the, and the city council subcommittee on these issues uh, to continue talking through some of the problems uh, to get a better sense and maybe work through the process of how things get before the commissions, which I know has been a question that we have asked many times, why do we get to see these things and not other things? Um, other commissions have that same issue too. So um, I think there'll be more on that. And I think this is, has the potential to become a fairly regular, maybe twice a year type of thing where there's a meetings uh, involving, involving the chairs of the, of the commission. So just wanted to keep all the commissioners appraised of that. Um, if you had any questions, if I could maybe answer them for you, of course. Um, and certainly if there's any concerns or anything that as I think there's a plan to have another meeting sometime in the fall uh, among the chairs and the subcommittee, if there's other issues that this, as individual commissioners feel about the operations of this commission and our work with the city um, and how we interrelate with staff, um, feel free to send them my way and it'll be a point that I'll make certain to bring up um, to the extent possible at the um, next joint meeting. So that's all on that. Other, other commissioner announcements? I had one. Um, we got approached by a homeowner on Clara Lane, uh, which is just east of Poline Road. It, it is a neighborhood that got exempted from the 2015 survey because it's not part of a subdivision. It was, uh, Poline used to run directly north from the cemetery. And these are homes that were developed in the 1930s and 40s and 50s um, along what used to be Poline and before Poline got rerouted. Um, so they've never been surveyed. And the homeowner was concerned about a property being sold for demolition and asked that we survey it. I am gonna do that. Uh, my, my plan is essentially to take the entire uh, Claire Lane, which is, it's about six to eight houses and do a, a district form to cover the entire neighborhood. It's, uh, it's near my home. It is outside my 1000 foot um, conflict of interest sound. So I, I, I think I'm fine to do it by myself. If anybody else had a burning desire to know more about Clara Lane, we could do a, a subcommittee. I apologize. I forgot to add that to the list. That that did come in. I because you took <laughs> you took control of it. I forgot all about it. My apologies. No problem. Thank, well, thank you, Commissioner Hickman. I've never even noticed that road. I'm looking at it Google Maps. It looks. It's, it's an interesting road, <laughs> and the. Yeah. Uh, there are some old buildings on there and the person that approached us thinks some of them might be quite old. I don't think they are. If they are old, they were moved. Um, I, I, there, there are no buildings there in the 19, early 1930s, but there are some interesting properties there. Oh, huh. well, thank you for, for, taking, for taking that on. Um, it's a nice way to <laughs> start doing any work in College Park. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, Commissioner Wan, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, if you need help, I can do that. I'm kind of close to the there. Okay. I'm very mm -hmm. close. So I, I, yeah, I'll get in contact with you. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, other commissioner announcements. Um, all right. Um, all right. Council liaison, any, any announcements? Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you again for your, your work this evening. Um, Nothing um, out of the ordinary. We have our um, council meeting tomorrow evening where we are hoping to adopt our budget moving forward. So if you have any um, public comment or anything of that nature, tomorrow night is the last opportunity to put that forward. Um, 
So please feel free to, you know, jump in and, and provide opportunity and feedback there. Um, other than that, nothing else this evening. Once again, thank you for all your work. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are any other announcements, or if there if there are no other announcements, excuse me, uh, I will accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. I, I saw Commissioner Rickman is quick on the quick on the draw. Commissioner Rickman moved. I'll accept a second. Second. Second by Commissioner Lowry. All right. Let's go around the horn. Commissioner Hickman. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Lowry. Aye. Commissioner Van Meter. Aye. Commissioner Montgomery. Aye. Commissioner Wan. Aye. And I am an aye as well. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for this evening. Stay cool. Um, and uh, again, um, we'll meet next time, next month. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Good night. Bye, everyone.